It is really lovely to be here, and I'm thrilled to be taking part in this whole event, and lovely to see everyone here. One or two of you I know, most of you I don't. As you've heard, my name is James Newcomb. Uh, my day job is as Bishop of Carlisle, but I have one or two other roles as well as Paul has mentioned. I've been in Cumbria for about 20 years now altogether, longer than I've lived anywhere else ever in my life. Um, as you may have detected from my accent, I don't actually come from Cumbria, but I really do feel fully a Cumbrian now. But I'm down in London periodically to be, as Paul mentioned, something called Clerk of the Closet. Now, you have only to say that, and most people burst out laughing. In fact, last week, I happened to mention this to a colleague in the House of Lords, and he came up to me only today and said, having heard that, he went back and told his family, and they couldn't stop laughing. Well, the name goes back to the 14th century, and in fact, in the Chapel Royal in St. James's Palace, there is a name board with all my predecessors on it, going back to people with just a Christian name uh, in the mid-14th century. The closet in those days was the royal bedchamber. And the royal bedchamber was in St. James's Palace. This was long before Buckingham Palace existed. And uh, I think the role really consisted of making sure that everything was in place for the royal household, especially when the king or queen went off on a royal progress all around the country. So although the closet didn't mean what you th thought it meant, uh, probably getting hold of the loo rolls was part of the task. I'm happy to say it no longer is. Now, the role has developed over the years, and uh, it sort of passed on to... Um, bishops um, sometime in about the 16th, 17th century. And a number of bishops have held this role, including Randall Davidson, probably one of the better known of them. And the clerk of the closet is head of what's called the ecclesiastical household. Her Majesty the Queen has two households. One is her sort of normal household. Um, I say normal, I'm not suggesting the other one is abnormal, though you may think it is when you hear. Uh, the normal household has as its head a master, and it has all sorts of people who are part of it, uh, Lord Chamberlain and goodness knows what, and it is absolutely huge. But there's also the ecclesiastical household, which consists of three bishops, that's me and the Bishop of London, who is Dean of the Chapels Royal, and at the moment, the Bishop of Worcester, who is the Lord High Armourer. It sounds just like something out of Gilbert and Sullivan, but he, he looks after the Maundy money service on Maundy Thursday. And then there are 35 royal chaplains uh, scattered all around the country. Uh, there is a deputy, a clerk of the closet, who lives at St. James's Palace and does all the hard work. There is a keeper of the closet, uh, which is interesting, who happens to be the head verger at Westminster Abbey at the moment. And there are a whole lot of people who are called priests in ordinary. Why they're called that, I still haven't discovered uh, nine years on, but they are, and they're part of this household. My responsibilities as clerk of the closet are not enormous. Um, I mentioned there are 35 royal chaplains well, when one of them dies or retires, they have to retire at 70, or becomes a bishop, which does periodically happen, or leaves under other circumstances, which also occasionally happens, um, I have to recommend a new one. And uh, those who are appointed by the queen uh, get to wear a rather gorgeous scarlet cassock, um, and they preach on an annual basis on something called the rota of weights. Again, I have no idea why it's called the rota of weights, but there is a rota of weights, they're on it, and they preach at the chapel royal once a year. And we have gatherings of this rather exclusive little club um, all around the country from time to time, which I organize. When there is a, a new diocesan bishop, 
and there are 42 diocesan bishops um, around the country. When there is a new one, <coughs> part of my task is accompanying them when they pay homage to the queen. They have to kneel in front of her, put their hands together as in prayer. She puts her hands around theirs, and they say an amazing uh, act of homage, basically saying, you are head of the church, you are head of this country, and woe betide anybody who forgets it, or words to that effect. <clears throat> and it's very ancient, goes back a long way, and it's a very, very moving experience. Where I'm taking the new Bishop of Salisbury <clears throat> there um, uh, on Thursday, a couple of days' time, Unfortunately, we have to do it by Zoom at the moment, which loses a certain amount of the kind of rather special feel, but hopefully we'll be back in person in the not too distant future. And then if anybody, such as Mark, were to write a book and dedicate it to the Queen, part of my task is vetting the book and making sure that it's suitable and would be acceptable to Her Majesty. That hasn't actually happened yet in the last nine years, but I live in hopes. Uh, I get to preach at the Chapel Royal and the Queen's Chapel, uh, the Savoy Chapel, Hampton Court, Chelsea Hospital, all over the place, wherever there's a kind of royal chapel. And <clears throat> part of my task, obviously, is praying for the Queen, together with all the other chaplains, as well as preaching, they pray. That's part of what they're there for. There are one or two perks of the job. One is the monumental salary. Seven guineas a year, which <laughs> has not changed since the mid 14th century, <laughs> despite inflation. And I have to say, I've never seen a penny of it. <laughs> and don't suppose I ever shall, but I think when I retire, I'll probably send in a bill backdated to 1350 with interest added, so I'll be a multi-multi-millionaire. Um, I get a pass, which lets me into any royal palace at any time of the day or night, which is fantastic. Not that I use it very much, but uh, it's there. Um, I get invited to garden parties in Buckingham Palace as sort of a member of staff, which is fun. And of course, the biggest perk of all is meeting the Queen herself. And just a, a very few words about her. Um, there'll be more sort of question and answer a bit later on. So we'll be developing some of these things. But just the first six words which struck me as I was jotting them down, um, thinking about this evening. Um, the first, of course, was her faith, her lively Bible-centered faith, which is what we're celebrating at this Platinum Jubilee event. Um, whenever one of these new bishops pays homage, one of the things they have to do is choose a Bible passage. And they choose a passage, and the Bible, which is on a sort of cushion, is open there while they're paying their homage. And when they've paid their homage, more often than not, and I, I warn them about this beforehand so that they're not totally taken by surprise, as often as not, the queen will say to the new bishop, what passage did you choose? And then she'll say, well, why that passage? And we get into a really interesting little Bible study on a verse or two from the passage that they have chosen. And that's just even more moving than the actual homage itself. And of course, um, her faith is right there up front in the fact that she attends church every week and innumerable references in her annual Christmas message. Second word was vocation. And this came across, of course, those of you who've read Servant Queen and the King She Serves. Uh, brilliant. If you haven't read it, as Paul mentioned, a million copies sold. Uh, we'll have seen quite a lot there about her anointing and how very important that was to her. Her very deep sense of being called by God 
to be queen quite unexpectedly. She hadn't expected that her father would die when he did. And uh, she was thrust into this at such a young age, but a massive sense of duty and calling. And that calling has never deserted her. It's been there as the rock right the way through um, on which she's uh, performed all the duties of being a queen. And tied in with that, of course, the third word, service. She dedicated her whole life, she said in her very first speech, to her people. And she is tremendously interested in ordinary people um, and in everyday life. She is a whole life disciple. She puts her faith to work, and it is fundamental to everything that she is and does. And that includes the innumerable meetings she has with all sorts of people, ranging from kings and queens and presidents and prime ministers through to ordinary people like most of us. And um, she's interested in everyday life. I remember on one occasion uh, the new bishop paying homage happened to be the Bishop of Leicester. And I, thinking to be rather clever, um, was able to talk not only about the way in which Leicester had just won the FA Cup, but also I just noticed on telly that somebody from Leicester had become the, snook the world champion of snooker. And so I was able to say, well, of course, ma'am, as you may know, uh, but of course you probably don't, somebody from Leicester's just become world snooker champion. To which the reply came, I know, I was watching. <laughs> you, you, she's really into sort of everything that's going on around in the world and is really interested in it. Fourth word, perseverance. Still working hard, very hard, at 96. Absolutely extraordinary. Meeting still huge numbers of people every day. And she's persevered through all the difficulties that have been in her family life and in her own life uh, through all these uh, 70 years. Absolutely extraordinary. Generosity, fifth word. And not only generosity, but all the fruit of the Spirit that's very evident, I think, in her life. Um, but particularly generous, not least with her time. I remember one of the gatherings we had of all these chaplains was at Windsor Castle. And she was meant to spend half an hour with us, just going around and then going off again. Um, already, you know, in her late 80s at that stage. And she spent an hour and a half, and she went around and she talked to every single person, and their husband or wife, if they were there, hugely generous with her time. And finally, um, her humor which I think is a really important aspect of her character. She has a really good sense of humor. And I discovered that on one occasion when uh, at this homage thing, I do the what are called the spiritualities and the Lord Chancellor of the day. And there have been seven during the time that I've been clerk of the closet. The Lord Chancellor of the day does the temporalities, but there was one day when um, the Lord Chancellor couldn't come. It happened to be Michael Gove. He'd just lost his job. David Cameron had just resigned. And Michael Gove's deputy, who was Theresa May, uh, had just become prime minister. So one way or another, none of them could be there. So we weren't quite sure what to do. So I had to go into the Queen and say, uh, Your Majesty, I'm terribly sorry. Um, I'm afraid Mr. Gove can't come. Well, she knew that already, so I didn't really need to tell her. Uh, so greatly daring, and I, I really don't know why I said this. I said, how, how would it be, ma'am, if I were to be Lord Chancellor just for today? To which she replied, what a good idea. So um, I was. And actually, I've done it four or five times since, for one reason or another, until a time when the Lord Chancellor of the day did turn up, and <laughs> poor chap came in with me to the Queen's presence. And she said, oh, hello, Mr. Whatever. Um, how nice to see you, but I don't know why you bothered. I have a perfectly good Lord Chancellor. <laughs> yeah. 
So my epitaph is going to be Lord Chancellor for half an hour, <laughs> I think. But a great sense of humor, a wonderful person who lives out her faith um, absolutely in everything she is and does. Well, that's all from me for the moment. I'm now going to introduce two people, Rob Hutton, who is an author and a journalist. I haven't met Rob before. It's been a delight to meet him briefly already this evening. And uh, I'm told he writes books about spies and funny words. One of the titles of one of his books is Would They Lie to You? I don't know what the answer is, but I look forward to discovering. And he writes parliamentary sketches for The Critic. Previously worked for Bloomberg, for the Mirror for the Financial Times, and in 2002, helped to set up Christians in Journalism, which has become a part of uh, Christians in Media. And I think he and Paul have known each other for quite a long time. And as well as Rob, Mark Green, who I have known for quite a long time, I'm very happy to say, was Executive Director of London Institute of Contemporary Christianity here for more than 20 years a passionate and engaging advocate of whole life discipleship, a very well-known and popular author. Uh, his books, little plug for those, include Thank God It's Monday, Fruitfulness on the Front Line, and of course, Servant Queen and the King She Serves, with Catherine Butcher, who I think is here also this evening, and now has written The Queen's Way, previously Vice Principal of the London School of Theology. And before that was one of the madmen, I think, advertising in London and New York. And I'm happy to say is very keen on film, which I am to delight to welcome uh, Rob and Mark, who are going to have a little conversation together. I have, I have so many questions. About, about the clerk of the closet. Um, actually, just to, there is a thing that we do as Christians, which is we, sort of, we find somebody who's in the public eye and we say, oh, that person's Christian, and we sort of appropriate them, them for ourselves. Uh, in your capacity, in, as Her Majesty's representative in this room, this is, what Mark is doing, the books he's writing, these are things that she is comfortable being done. This is not being done, as it were, behind her back, is it? No, I'll stand up so that you can see everybody. No, it's certainly not behind her back. In fact, as she wrote the foreword to the servant queen and the king she serves, which is almost unheard of. I'm not sure she'd actually written a foreword to a book before, which I think illustrates how very much she appreciated that happening. And um, I was saying to Mark just a little earlier, uh, I had a letter from a very senior member of the royal household saying how much he'd appreciated that book and how very accurately they felt it portrayed her and her faith. Right, eh? That's him. I... When Paul asked me, to, I, I think I think we'll we'll come back to you in a moment. <laughs> but they, when when Paul asked me to do this, my initial response was, "I'm not really a big Queen person." Um, uh, I, I, having worked for Bloomberg, who are an American organisation, and I was the political editor, and that meant that every so often um, there would be a royal story, and there being nobody else at Bloomberg who could write it, I would be the person who would be asked to write it, and I always did this hugely grudgingly um, and with a big sulk, especially when it was, became one of my most read stories of the year. Um, uh, so so I, I sort of, I came to this very much not as an anti-monarchist, but just not as a sort of, not as a monarchist. And sorry, we're going to swap microphones, are we? Um, and, um, but, but Mark, you, I, I don't think your position was that different when you started this, was it? I mean, what, what, what was sort of your feeling? 
Well, my feeling, hi everybody, fantastic to see you, lovely to see you, and thank you, Bishop. I just want to say to begin with that uh, the Bishop may not have vetted the, the books that we've written about the Queen in order for her to have a dedication, though I would have given her one if I'd known that was a possibility, uh, but he did vet them. Uh, so they are kosher, I think, that would be fair to say. Um, Yes, no, I mean, I think the story is a simple one. I mean, I, I suppose I, it was 2015, I think I, I was appreciative of the Queen. I thought, you know, she's a good egg, and I listened to the addresses from time to time. But the way that it came about um, for me was that I was at home. I'd written a book um, called Fruitfulness on the Front Line, which is about being Christian in ordinary life and the rich possibilities of, of that. And I was sitting at home, and um, I, I was kind of talking to God. I, I hesitate to say that I was really pray, 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 but I was kind of talking to God, which I think is also prayer. And I was saying, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be great if there was somebody who was actually in the public eye who lived out this framework that we've developed? And uh, quick as a flash of lightning or thunder or whatever, it, it came to me, and I was the queen. And I was a bit, frankly, a bit shocked by this, I think, really? But it came, I guess we've all had bright ideas before, and uh, I've had a few, and a lot of them haven't turned out to be so bright. <laughs> but uh, this one came with a kind of force. And in Isaiah, it talks about, you know, the God spoke, God spoke to him with a strong hand. It came with a kind of force. And I began to think about it, and I realized, you know, does the queen model godly character? Well, we've heard from the bishop, well, yes, she does. You know, patience, kindness, generosity, a certain joy in life. Does she do good work? Which was the second criteria we had for, you know, the godly disciple in everyday life. Well, absolutely. Does she minister grace and love? Does she go the extra mile for people? And there's all these stories of this. Does she create a culture around her? Well, you know, the stories of the way uh, the royal household has operated over the last 70 years are really almost overwhelmingly positive. And she's also done something called the Commonwealth, which we may come back to. And then, you know, does she stand up for truth and justice? And you suddenly think, well, she's, she's spoken on disability, she's spoken on uh, children, she's spoken on oppressed women, I mean, she's spoken all these things in her speeches. And does she share the gospel? Yeah, well, six out of six. And I thought, my goodness. And so what I felt was, I, want, I felt a weight to get this message out, and I was, Similar to you, I probably was at Monarchist, as it happens. I'm prepared to admit that, and I still am. But um, I, to, to get this story out, and then by an extraordinary series of events, uh, a book was published in record time. Um, I mean, some people know the story, but it was an extraordinary thing. And there was a kind of, just because something happens quickly doesn't mean that the Lord is behind it. Just because something happens slowly doesn't mean that he's against it. But this was a series of really extraordinary events that, that propelled that forward. And there was that sense of God really wanting that message out. Yeah. Now, now what you've done for this book is, is you've, you've gone through her speeches. Now, I, to talk shop for him, the Queen never gives interviews. She basically never says anything. She's a, a, a sort of journalistic black hole. And, and when... When we did the Scottish referendum, she made one remark that she hoped people thought carefully before they, vote, they voted, and those words were analysed to death on both sides of the border. Um, during the Brexit referendum, the Sun claimed that they they would sort of they spoke for the Queen. It's not clear whether the clerk of the closet signed off that front page. <laughs> uh, it, but basically, she's a she's a complete enigma, except once a year when she talks to camera for five minutes, and it is her. It is her. I mean, I think, um, I think what we know is that lots of her other speeches, including the Queen's speech, obviously, are uh, written by other people. But this she writes herself, and like most writers, she asks them people's opinions. She would you know, often ask Prince Philip in the past or her private secretary, but it's not going to the Prime Minister. It's not going anywhere else. It's, it's, it's her words. It's her thoughts. Um, yeah. So it's the closest thing we get to her authentic voice, talking about what she wants to say to the country. And if you, if, if you don't watch the Queen's speech, which I, not the Queen's speech, I do watch, I watch all the Queen's speeches. If you don't watch the, the, um, the, the, the Christmas uh, speech, um, 
what you get is the is is the version that is sort of mediated through the papers, yeah. which tends to be well. I mean, I, I'm not going to apologise for this. We find the news line. So, for the most recent one, it was inevitably it was it was the first two or three minutes where she talked about Prince Philip and uh, the impact he'd had on her life, and it's it's incredibly moving tribute, um, and that's the news line. And and if you're if you but if you sit and you read them and you go through them, the, the last minute is often quite interesting as well, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that, that would be the case, yeah. The uh, last couple of minutes, yeah. And what did, you, what, what, what did you find then when you did, when you did this sort of this analysis? Well, um, quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose the, the first thing that really um, struck me is that when, when, you, when you look at, say, you know, she's got usually no more than 650 words, which is not that many. The longest, I think, are just over 750. The total of 69, 70 speeches is 45,000 words. So do the, do the math, as they say in America, it's, it's 650 words. So it's not that many. But when you actually put together all the things that she actually says that either have a Christian worldview, which is almost all of it, or are specifically about Jesus, then, then you're looking at a sort of, you know, it's, it's longer than Ephesians, put it that way. It's, it's, it's longer than Ephesians and Colossians and Philippians put together. You, you, you've actually got quite a lot uh, of what she says. And suppose, you know, um, you know, I mean, that's a bit of a broad question. I'm not quite sure how to answer well, okay. it. So this hasn't, there, there, is a, there is a pattern that emerges. There is a pattern in the sense that um, certain um, themes come through and they, um, they come through, cons some of them consistently. So I've done some analysis of you know, she, how often she mentions peace, which is an awful lot. How often she mentions the marginalized or looking after neighbors, which is a huge amount. Uh, how often she mentions Prince Philip, which is one in three. Uh, he gets a mention, not at all in the 1970s. Who, know what it, who knows what he did wrong? And, and, and he stopped, she stopped calling my husband in around about 1968 in the Christmas speeches. And I don't know what that was either, but after that he was Prince Philip. And, and then you've got, um, an as a pattern, you move, if you like, in the speeches from what you might call a third person presentation of Jesus, the child in the manger, the one who was born in Bethlehem, um, really throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And then just in the 90s, she starts to call him Jesus or Christ. And by the time you get to 2000, almost all the speeches from 2000 and on, she's using the word Jesus or then calling him by name, calling him Christ. And the other move, which was really significant to me in terms of, I mean, communication strategy you'd be interested, I guess, is that she moves from the third person, you know, he is wonderful and so on and so forth, which we take as, as read that, he, that, that she believes this, to saying, I believe this. It is my belief that. Or she uses what I think the grammarians called the inclusive we. We know where to look for this kind of power and hope um, and so on. So she's become, in a sense, in communication terms, apparently much more personal. Um, though it may have been very personal to her when she was um, actually speaking in the more usual, mm. reserved, somewhat shy, self-effacing Windsor style. Yeah. I mean, so her most recent one, she said, I think that the teachings of Jesus have been the bedrock of my, of my life. And I, I, heard, I thought that's a very, that's a that's a that's a way of looking at things, as it were, that that you sort of have to believe it to come up with, in a way. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. That, that phrase it's very interesting because I think one of the other things that I noticed um, was that her language, the, the words she uses and the phrases she uses, are often what you might call somewhat original. So um, we've heard, you know, rock is quite a common way to talk about Jesus. Um, but bedrock isn't. It's not in the Bible per se. So she's kind of owned that from somewhere. I, I don't think I've heard that before. Maybe I have. Maybe there's 19 books written by Philip Yancey which says bedrock. I absolutely <laughs> do not know. But, but actually bedrock is, it's actually, you know, bedrock, you, know, you can move a rock. You can't move bedrock without moving the earth. You know what I mean? It's, it's a big word. And there are other things like that. Um, so for example, uh, she talks about Jesus being her inner light. Well, Jesus is a light, yes, but inner light. 
Well, that's actually a very different idea, isn't it? It's, it's, it's you know, reminiscent of if you abide in me and I abide in you. It's Jesus dwelling in her. It's a sense of something personal, something intimate. It's not separable. It's not that I go to the word of God, though she does every day, or pretty much every day, to find this. Actually, he's in me. And similarly, she talks about him as um, a compelling example. Well, you know, there are books called The Imitation of Christ, and Paul says, you know, imitate me as I imitate Christ, and so on. But, you know, you pop it compelling on the front of that, mm. and that is, he compels me. So I think to your point, there is a kind of originality to some of her language, which suggests that she's owned it, she's processed it, and she's speaking at it now as, as her own. This is personal language. It, so we have a constitutional monarchy. Technically, she has, technically she has huge power. Actually, she has no power, sort of. A, what difference do you think it makes then having someone in that role who's who has a living faith? Sell this to me. What? what why does this matter fundamentally? Uh, to you. <laughs> Yeah, why does this matter? Well, that's a really good question, isn't it? I mean, um, first of all, um, it clearly matters to God that uh, the leaders of a country or the people who are um, standing in those kind of roles uh, love him and seek to obey him. And when you look at the criteria for kingship uh, or queenship in the Bible, Deuteronomy 17, you know, somebody who is is writing out the word of God, in other words, somebody who's soaking themselves in the word of God, um, somebody who doesn't acquire too many horses, <laughs> uh, somebody who doesn't acquire too much money, but, but horses in the Old Testament are about military power. They're not about, you know, Windsor and, As As you know, Eton and Ascot and racing, racing and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, but it's also about um, somebody who seeks the Lord's face, and then it says, somebody who does not see themselves as different from anybody else. In other words, total lack of entitlement. Mm. So to have somebody in power who is praying for the country, who I think in some ways stands in that gap is really significant. The other thing I think that the Queen has chosen to do, um, which sits within, um, if you like, the history of the House of Windsor and, and certainly Victoria, George V and so on, is that she has a view of the country and of what we're about and what we should be about, which is rooted in the Bible and which she spends an enormous amount of her actual time doing something about. What do I mean by that? Well, <coughs> her vision for the country, which she set out, I think, in 1956, was she said, I, I can't lead you in battle. So the original Elizabeth with her sword in the air down at, you know, down at the docks with Sir Francis Drake is not open to her. I don't make policy, but I, but I love these islands. And my, my yearning, basically, she says, is that Britain would be an encouragement to upright people everywhere. Now, that is actually an extraordinary vision, that we would be an encouragement to upright people everywhere. In other words, here she is, she's the, the granddaughter of somebody who ruled a quarter of the planet. This isn't about empire. This isn't a vision of sort of um, regenerated imperial grandeur. This isn't about Britain continuing to have a significant place in, military, in the military. This isn't a vision of massive economic prosperity. This is a moral vision. And that moral vision is extremely like, is it not, the vision that God had for Israel that Israel, the people of Israel will be a light unto the Gentiles, which is also a word in Hebrew means the nations. So this is what she's looking for, this sense of uprightness. And so what does she do with her life and what does she call us to? Well, one of the things that I did discover by doing research on this, and obviously the bishop would know much more about this than I, is that she's, you know, she has spent, and our royal family has spent, an enormous amount of time with people who don't have much. A survey was done, I think, in the 60s, saying you were twice as likely to meet a royal in a welfare context than in any other. In other words, where is she going? She's going to hospitals. 
She's going to open this and to open that. She's going, yes, to open a factory, but there are loads of workers there. She's going to hospices. She's going, you know, where does Princess Anne visit seven prisons a year and works with children around the world, et cetera, et cetera. Charles has, you know, back in 2000, had already created 39,000 new businesses. I mean, this is what they do. And it's not what we see, because again, it's not a yeah. media story. What we see is the glitz and the ceremonial. And so when she says, which she does, this sense of what is she calling us to? So she has a vision for what it means to be a citizen. And that vision is about uh, selflessness. But that's, so there is, I mean, one of the things about the LICC is, is that it's trying to work out what the Bible has to say about our ordinary lives. She has one of very few jobs that the Bible has a huge amount to say about how, whether you're doing it well or badly. There's just tons about kinging. Um, do, you, do you see that? How, how, how do we see that? Well, I mean, um, there is tons about kinging, but actually when you begin to look at it, um, the Bible actually makes it simple for them. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, so Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy makes it very clear. These are the things you want to do. As I said, you, you read the Bible, you imbibe it. Mm. You don't seek to acquire massive military power. You don't seem to acquire uh, wealth. You don't marry too many uh, foreign women and so on. And then when, when you get arguably other than David, you know, uh, the description of Hezekiah, who is described as there was no king like him before or after. Now, what does Hezekiah do? Well, it says of him, is he trusted in the Lord? Uh, he sought his face. And then it says he, he clung to the Lord. And the word in the Hebrew is davak, which is cling or, or cleave. In other words, it's the same word used of marriage in, in Genesis. You know, man and woman, he shall cleave to his wife and she mm. shall cleave to him and so on. So does she do those things? And the answer is, yes, she does. And I mean... <sighs> We are not Jesus, but Jesus as a Jesus's model of kinging is is quite unlike any 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 other monarch. The, the this idea of of a of a of a king who is not putting themselves up above others, but is is washing their feet. Yes. And I, sp I suppose that's. I mean, that the, the the last book was the Servant Queen. Do, you, do, you, do we find that in the, in the speeches? How do, we, how do we see that? Yeah, no, I think uh, that's uh, the, the, the question. I think what really hit me by looking at the speeches was not just, okay, so we have the headline from the, the previous mm. book and, and there is some discussion there. What hit me is just how often she refers to Jesus and the way that he serves, um, his words about service, the fact that he uh, came not to serve, not to be served, rather, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what shapes her. She talks about, um, you know, God coming in humble service for his people and so on. Um, and so it's absolutely all the way through. So when, when she, she's, she's, she says, for example, that Jesus came, and he stretches out his hands, and he restored love and service to the center of our lives. And I think, actually, when you, when you think about that, um, she's got some particular understandings of how you take your particular gifts. But when you just think about it in terms of service, you say, well, here's this, this woman. She's got an awful lot. Uh, does she behave as an entitled person? Well, that family has never behaved, or at least you know, the, the, has, you know, for a long time is entitled. You know, George V did not behave entitled. The, you know, the, the, the wartime hmm. king and queen were, you know, were on rations, you know, there was a line on the bar above which the water did not go. Um, you know, they were sharing with this in that sense. And then that sense of the servant, you think about the things that she doesn't have to do and the things she has to do that she does with good grace. So she gives lots of speeches where she is not allowed to show any expression at all. So you come to the Queen's speech, which I think Charles did rather well, and he doesn't go, oh, that's a really good idea, isn't it? About time you did something for young people, whoa! 
Oh, gosh, well, if only the last lot had done that five, 10 years ago, whatever it is. Mm. No, no, you can't do that because any nuance of voice tone or the raise of an eyebrow suggests a political allegiance. Can't do that. So they go and read these speeches, and it's boring for them. It's <laughs> absolutely but must be boring for them. And then you think of other things that they have to do. She has to entertain people, and this is a quality of hospitality whose values she probably does not agree with. You get the president of China here who thinks he's a god. This is not, you know, this is not the kind of person that she would normally. But she, so she shook hands with Sinn Fein. She for did. For instance, who stood pretty near people who killed her relatives. Yeah, and I think she was utterly delighted to be able to do that. I think this is the thing that I, I was interested that you write about. One of the. Because she has been queen for so long, very few, I'm not sure even anyone here can remember a time when she wasn't queen. The, the, it's very hard for us to grasp how things might have been different with a different, with a different monarch. But let's talk, about, let's talk about reconciliation, which is one of the, one of the hardest calls is to forgive and forgive people who've really hurt you. Yeah. So um, I think the, she does speak a lot about reconciliation. And there is a lot about reconciliation in the 1970s, as you might expect. The, you know, the Irish troubles, the, the bombings in London. I can't remember exactly when Inniskillen was. I think it was around about then. So she writes a lot about that. And then when she comes up to. Um, the uh, Silver Jubilee, she says in 1976, you know, the gift I would most like is, without mentioning Northern Ireland, but she mentions is, is that there would be reconciliation wherever it is needed. And in 1972, she talks about it in terms of Northern Ireland. So she's, she, she asks for that consistently. But I think what is interesting to me is that she consistently ties it back to Jesus. He shows us the way, you know, how do, how do we, you know, where do you find God's love? In his, in his power to forgive. Uh, forgiveness is what, you know, um, without forgiveness, his families fall apart, disintegrated in 1984. So again and again, she's, she's communicating that reconciliation, forgiving one another, making peace, though it's very hard, is difficult to do. So again in 1976, which is, you know, 200, it's, it's the American independence. And so she begins there and says, you know, we're all friends now. But actually, it takes time, and these things are difficult. And then she pivots to, if you like, Northern Ireland and so on. But she uses that to talk about Jesus as, a, as, as the source of reconciliation and power for it and her model for it. Yeah. And the other, I mean, obviously, America isn't in the Commonwealth. But the, one of the dominating things of her early reign is the empire breaking up. and. I mean, I, one, one, actually one of my nicer jobs, I do do a lot of Commonwealth summits, which are quite jolly, because you go somewhere sunny and there's no news for two days. <laughs> uh, yes. um, uh, and um, <laughs> what's interesting about those is the extent to which we have somehow managed to stay friends with people who have every right, really, to not be friends with us. No, I... I... It's an interesting thing, I think, that, again, I think that is probably theologically uh, rooted, her, her vision for the Commonwealth. And that is so, as, as you say, you know, these 70 countries or whatever it was then, it's now 54 in the Commonwealth, but we had all these colonies, territories that we had essentially exploited. And, you know, some, some we were nicer to than others, and so on and so forth. Some we left them railways and the civil service and so on, and others not so good. Uh, and yet, somehow, she has managed to turn people who we had exploited into friends and to create this fellowship, really. It's a kind of, mm. it is a fellowship um, of 54 countries now, whether they become republics or not, who want to get together and want to find ways of cooperating around shared values and shared needs across a variety of re religions. And and as she said early on, she said, you know, this is unprecedented in history, that this kind of this kind of vision. And then she went on 25 years later, she said, I have been able to see 
from a unique vantage point, in other words, from the center of the Commonwealth, the last, if you like, I don't think she said this, the last flailings of empire turn into a fellowship. I think it's an extraordinary achievement. Most British uh, prime ministers and politicians and parties are not at all interested in this. But she is, and I think she's interested in it, partly because she made a promise that she would serve those people, and so she keeps her promises. But I think there's something deeper, which is um, it's not an idea of the left or the right. I mean, in some ways, it's utopian. I think it's straight out of the Bible. It's a global vision in which one day all nations will be at peace, although, of course, they will then bow down before the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's what she's working for. You know, I mean, I know apparently in the old days, beauty pageant winners used to be asked, you know, what do you want? World peace. But I think, you know, I think that's, I think the Queen wants world peace. The, the, one of the abiding images of last year, again, was uh, the Queen sitting alone at her husband's funeral. And especially given that we now know what happened in Downing Street the night before, um, just talk us through that that decision essentially to 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 go through that awful time alone. What does it, what, what what do you take from that? Well, um, I I I think it showed um, a tremendous humility. And I think there was no other decision that would have, would have occurred to her to make. Because I think she has no sense of entitlement in that way. I mean, I believe she was, the government said, look, you know, yeah. we can. But it was like, you know, you can have more rations in Buckingham Palace in the Second World War, they're not going to do it. And the only time I think they ever went against that was when I think the country really wanted to have a nice wedding dress. So, so she was given a load of coupons to have a nice wedding dress, and everyone, you know, you know they, and that was actually part of lifting people up. And I think she says these sorts of things. You see, she says, you know, that there's an egalitarianism. And when she calls the country uh, to uh, neighbor love, which she does, and to caring for other people, she, she's got this tremendous sense of inclusiveness. Um, again and again, she will say things like, um, you know, whether you don't think you're doing anything um, really very significant, or whether you do, whether you've got a really, one point she says, a really monotonous and dull life. <laughs> you know, whatever your situation, you know, if you're just living a decent life, I want to thank you, you know, for that. And then you'll recall if, if, mm. if in, in the COVID address, where she, she not only thanks the frontline workers, I mean, it's a very, very, um, I don't know if she wrote that speech, by the way, but if she didn't, it's at, you know the people who did write it know her very well. So yeah, she thanks the frontline NHS workers and appreciates them. And then she says, and I want to thank all of those of you who are isolating at home and being set apart from friends, because by doing so, you are preventing many others suffering the pain that those who have lost people are suffering. Thank you for doing that. So she's always including the ordinary person in almost everything. You know, it happens a lot. The ordinary person gets a mention as part of this. So she, she wouldn't want to do anything different than we were all required, required to do. The, the, the criticism I saw, it, I saw it the other day, the live question is still having Prince Andrew at events after, oh, I don't quite know how we put, after he settled his case, do you want to, I mean, there's a lot of people who would say, look, this is, this, this, there you are, that's really her, that's, in the end, she's, you know, she's giving, she's giving him an alibi, even though he, he's behaved pretty appallingly. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Yep, my phone. <laughs> um, it's really lovely to, so I, I think um, um, that that is consistent with her understanding of reconciliation and forgiveness. So on the one hand, she says, you are no longer going to do, you no longer represent the royal household. You don't stand for me anymore in that sense. You're not an ambassador of mine. You don't have any official royal duties. But when it comes to um, 
Prince Philip's memorial service. That's his dad. And this is his mum. And this is a one level, although a national occasion, it is also a personal occasion. And she wants to say by asking Andrew, um, who is not married and doesn't have anyone else to walk up the aisle with in that sense, whether he will he will be the one who will take her arm and walk her out, which she does. And that is an affirmation, I think, that this is my son. I love you, but you don't have a job. But you're my son. And I don't know if that satisfies you or not. No, I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's so difficult, isn't it? Because, because one of the odd things about this family is that they are they have a professional role, but they are also people, people living lives. And yeah. yes, and Prince Andrew has a professional role and no longer, Prince Andrew has behaved badly, but at the same time, Prince Andrew has lost his father and uh, Prince Andrew remains her son. Um, the other question that, that we all slightly pussyfoot around in public, although, uh, are we being live streamed? I've written an obituary. There are there are obituaries ready. Mine's really good. Um, uh, I, I, <laughs> so it's for Bloomberg, so it may not have my name on it. But um, at some point, we're going to hand over. Where do we see Prince Charles? Because I think the thing that people who, who are uh, not necessarily monarchists might say, well, I, her, I'm fine with, but the rest of them. Uh, I'm not so sure about. Do you have any sense of where Prince Charles sort of sits on the faith scale? I do have a sense of that, yes. And um, so um, when we wrote The Servant Queen, uh, we, we talked to many people, particularly James and other people who part of um, or had worked, one of them had worked for Prince Charles. I don't want to say the title because that would be inappropriate. Yeah. And uh, we asked him those sorts of questions. We asked everybody, really. As you remember, Catherine, we, we, we tried to make sure that it wasn't hagiography. Anything we said, no one will tell you a story. <laughs> no one will tell you a story. But they will tell you whether you're right or wrong about something of the kind of things that we were writing about. And uh, this question came up. And I think the first response from this person was that Charles was misunderstood when he was talking about defender of faiths. In fact, the Queen has said something quite similar in which, where she said, you know, one of the duties of if you like, the head of the Church of England, is to protect the freedom of worship of all faiths, and particularly in a secular age. And she's very clear about what she believes. And the second thing the person said is that a little bit like, and people differ on these things, and who are we to know the parts of people, that um, Charles has a genuine faith, and um, he's, he's unlikely to be a Pentecostal. <laughs> <laughs> unlike the Queen, of course, um, unlike to be a Pentecostal, and um, you know, just as many people believe that Prince Philip had a genuine faith, other people think he was just interested in theology. But you know, um, so I think, I think from that point of view, if you're asking a question about where he stands, I think he will, he stands there. Um, the reasons there's lots of reasons why uh, Charles has got issues, if you like. Mm. Um, one of them, of course, is to do with uh, Lady Diana, who in many ways did a superb job as a, an ambassador of philanthropy and so on. Another one is that um, he, if I can say this, he, he needs a new communications director. <laughs> because when I started reading about these 39,000 jobs, and this was in 2000, and so 39,000 businesses and 60,000 employees at that point and 100,000 people in a study, school study program that he had set up. And then you, and, and, and actually the Prince's thing was done with his own money and then you, somebody in our team, his band still do practice in a room that was set up by, by the, the Charles. And then you, and, and Ian Bradley, who wrote a book on the monarchy in 2002 said, he is the supreme example within the royal family of somebody committed to public service and to charitable work and to effectively generating mm. uh, 
good things for the young and for business. So he was also ahead of the game on climate change. He was ahead of the game on um, organics. He gets absolutely no credit for that. Um, and of course, he's got this manner. <laughs> but actually, you know, I think he's something of a, you know, and he doesn't have to do any of those things. Mm. Look at the history of princes. Do they spend a third of their time doing this sort of stuff or half that? No, they don't. It's a choice. So whether this is merely nominal Christian social action or it's heartfelt Christian social action, he's made an enormous contribution to the country. It was estimated in 2002 that he contributed 12 billion to the UK economy through his initiatives, which is quite a lot. It's not bad. <laughs> so we're going to take a break for a moment. And you can, the idea is this, is, this is the moment in church that my wife hates. Um, where I'm going to ask you to, to talk to your, your neighbours um, and decide what I should have asked, um, and uh, and then we'll open it up to the floor and uh, and you can all throw some questions in. Um, I've been listening, and what you've been saying has been really interesting. A um, couple of things came to mind um, in your descriptions of the Queen. One was the um, one of the verses that came to me that sums up the Queen's life is, I think, Ephesians 2.10, about a life of good deeds that have already been prepared for you to do. And I must admit, I think the Queen has been doing good deeds since the day she took the crown. But the other question I have is the fact that you also mentioned in the kings of the Old Testament that Hezekiah was the king that there'd been none like before and none like after. And I do worry that I'm hoping that that won't be what is said about Queen Elizabeth because I think as Christians in the nation, we should also be praying for the next heir to the throne, not only the one who takes over from Elizabeth, but the ones further down the line because we've got responsibility as Christians to pray for those people. And often, having come from Scotland, I realize that many of the Church of England's I've been in don't seem to pray for the Queen as much as I thought they would based on the old prayer book system. So I just wonder if you have any thoughts on that. I think you should uh, address that to the good bishop and ask him what he's doing with his clergy. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> well, um, the Queen is very keen on the Book of Common Prayer and the King James Version of the Bible. And there is a prayer which I was proposing to use later, actually, this evening, which is said for the Queen every day in Parliament. Um, bishops take it in turns to lead the prayers, and we pray for the Queen and also for all the royal family, including Prince Charles. And that is every single day. Uh, with regard to clergy in the diocese, um, I don't think they're praying for the Queen every day, but I am. And so are these other royal chaplains all around the country. And we're praying for the royal family and for whoever might succeed her as well. So it is happening, and you're quite right. We need to be praying for everybody. Very tough act to follow. There is a sense, isn't there, really, that part of the question behind part of the issue behind the question is also whether there is a, um, a consciousness within the church of the importance of leadership in general uh, within the world wherever that might be and so clearly at one level you pray for the queen as a head but historically you pray for people in leadership so Paul wanting us in Romans 13 to pray for those in authority and um, I think that is a, that's a challenge right down the line, if you see what I mean, right, right down the line. The notion that I would pray for my, you know, God's blessing on my boss, you know, it's an incredibly challenging thing to do, <laughs> um, and so on, or that people would have prayed for me, or that I would pray for my counselors, you know, at, you know, in the local authority, or and so on and so forth. So there is a, there is a, there is a question about the church's culture of prayer into the world in general, of which the prayer for 
the monarch historically was you know the key at one level because they most monarchs did lead you into battle historically and and you know did make policy to some extent so i think it's a, there's a, there's another thing underneath what you're saying which is do we have a culture of praying for those in authority on a regular basis seek because they have such impact on the shalom of of the cities the towns the villages of the nation that we're in and i think that's probably part of why we don't pay for the queen either i, I mean one of the things in my very low churching um is i noticed since 2016 more prayer for the government um when it did seem to be rather struggling um i don't know if others noticed that another is it question a tory, is it is it a labor or tory constituency it, it was a very tory constituency actually but we were praying um <laughs> the, the government clearly needed prayer <laughs> um, uh, Julia. So my question is, um, do you have any sense of which of her parents had the strongest sort of spiritual, moral, personal influence on her at all? Um, I, I, I do have a sense of it, but I think, you know, I'm, I haven't positioned myself as an expert on the queen per se, but I think she was very close to her father. And uh, clearly her mother, um, who was you know, brought up reading the Bible every day and brought the children up that way, um, also you know, was clearly heavily influential. But I suspect in terms of that sense of, of calling, once she became, once she knew where she was going, there was that bond with her father, who was also similarly highly dedicated to service. And I think she gr probably would have grasped, because it was so clear in a sense that he didn't, he was, called to it, but he was in some ways called to it in weakness. And I think she believed that he, in a way, sacrificed himself for that, served in that way. And I think Winston Churchill, when he laid the wreath on, on the king's grave or coffin, I can't remember which it was, he, he put two words, for gallantry. So I think I would say that, you know, if, if I were to choose, I think it would probably be her dad, but they were both very, very significant to her in, in her formation. Anyway. Um, my question, uh, the, she did once say that she hoped her grandchildren would share her values and her faith. And then she had Billy Graham uh, preach, and she has you and others. Um, it's very hard for people in public life like that to have genuine fellowship and encouragement and I just wonder to what extent uh, William, Harry, Eugenie and the others do have the opportunity to see um, and experience lively faith. It's a really interesting question and I don't fully know the answer to that because I don't come across them a huge amount. But what I do know is that they've had lots of opportunities to be in touch with people who've talked with them at great length about faith, not least when they've come to significant moments in their lives, like getting married and all that sort of thing. I do know people who've been involved with them at those points. And there are one or two people around, I would mention, who um, actually have a significant spiritual influence both on the Queen and on her children and grandchildren um, and to whom they turn, who, who are real sort of counsellors and are around quite a lot. So I think probably the answer is more than one might think. Prince Charles has been heard to say, I don't want to be head of the Church of England that was right and also various things he doesn't seem to have faith of it at all i wonder have you any evidence and uh, have i remembered that correctly yeah you're going to get that one too right <laughs> there was a time when there was a whole thing about defender of the faith wasn't there and he said well no i'm defender of faith and i think that's because of his very keen interest in interfaith dialogue. 
But for those I know who, I mean, obviously I've come across him periodically, but for those who do know him very well, he uh, has much more of a faith, I think, than one might imagine a Christian faith. And I don't think now would say, I don't want to be head of the Church of England. I think he'd have changed from where perhaps he was a little while ago. So um, uh, he, I think, would definitely call himself a Christian, but is keen to engage with people of other faiths as well and um, uh, share certain spiritual values with them. And that's, I think that's where he stands. Does it, obviously, historically, we've had lots of heads of the Church of England who were not really very Christian at all, I, in so far as anyone can tell, but I, we can tell. Um, does that trouble you as a, as a bishop? Does, is, that the, the, that, is that the sort of thing that would, would worry you? Or I think um, we've been in, I can't remember a time when the Queen has not been head of the Church of England, so, so in a sense I haven't experienced that. Uh, if it were the case, actually the way it works, it, it, with the church, it's, it's rather like the, with the government. Um, it's more influence than power. And if somebody was not keen on the Christian faith and didn't have a particular faith themselves, well, A, I think probably they wouldn't take it on. But B, uh, I don't think they'd be able to do much damage, if I can put it like that. <laughs> um, whereas for somebody who is a Christian, as the Queen is, and is head of the church, she's able to do an awful lot of good. Any more? I, I, have, I have one more, which is we started this talking about your work at the LICC and your your mission, as it were, is to ordinary people who are struggling to live Christianly in ordinary lives. And we have spent this evening talking about somebody who does not have an ordinary life and is, is not an ordinary person. What, 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 what actual use is any of this to, to us? Well, thank you for that. That's, uh, <laughs> it's always get, good to get your rude... I got a cupcake. Yeah, yeah you got a cupcake and you can walk out of here. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, it's a good question. So the point, I think, of why I was interested in the Queen was, first of all, as I said, God told me to be interested in the Queen. He told me to be interested in the Queen because she displayed certain ways of behaving which we, we see in the Bible within her own calling. So she's got a particular calling. And the first point about that is that the Queen embraces her calling. And we've all got that choice. Are we going to embrace our calling or not? Uh, this is where God has put us, in this place, at this time, with these people. Am I going to go, I don't really want to do that. I think that's not his word. No, no, forget it. And we've seen Rose have done that. She's embraced her calling. Like Mary, she says yes to God in that sense. Secondly, I think the thing that I, I think is amazing, really, and of course she's had a, a little bit longer to think about it than I have, uh, marginally, um, <laughs> you know, is how much um, she has sought to think about everything that she does through the lens of the example of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus, and the empowerment of Jesus in a posture of being his servant, not just ours, but his. So th these speeches are full of, essentially she says things like, you know, um, this is the framework in which I live my life. Um, we all are either going to live within the Christian framework or we're not. And she talks about her personal accountability to God. Well, you know, how, how many of do we really wake up in the morning and think, Okay, God, I'm accountable to you today, and at the end of the day, I'm going to ask you, how are we getting on? I mean, there are people with those practices, but she clearly feels accountable. She sees her, she talks about, you know, um, we're taught to love our neighbor, which is easy to say, but it's quite hard. And then she, the word she uses is obey, not do. Jesus is not just a guru to her, he's a commander, he's Lord. 
So you think, well, I'm meant to obey. We all in situations where, in a sense, there are things we'd rather not do, or ways, impulses we have which we'd rather indulge than, than resist or ask God's power for. And she has to do that. And so what I see at one level is, yes, she's in an extraordinary job. She is. But she has chosen to try to do that job as a servant of the Lord Jesus. And I think that's a question we all have to ask ourselves at whatever level of society we are. And to recognize, in a sense, as she has done, that the little things matter. And that is another theme. You know, you can do something little, and it matters, and it matters, and it matters, and it matters. And lots of the stories that people tell about the Queen, um, there's a whole book of them by Joanna Lumley. This is a good ruse. Get your celebrity mates to tell you how they met the Queen. And <laughs> write them up and then put a forward and an afterward and hey, bingo, sell a million copies. For royalties. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get any royalties. But, but when you look at those stories, that's exactly what's going on. I, I, I um, was um, doing Songs of Praise for the, um, I'm not allowed to say this, I'm sure, but the Songs of Praise is coming out and there's a Platinum Jubilee one, as you might expect. So anyway, I meet Alad, Alad Jones. And I said to him, he's met the Queen several times. Some of you may be familiar with him. He's a, he, was a, he was a boy soprano, a beautiful voice. He still sings very well. I don't think he's a soprano anymore. And, uh, and a gifted guy. And, and, he, and I said, well, you know, what was it like meeting the Queen? He said, oh, I've met her several times. And I said, well, what, what's it about her that you appreciate? He said, uh, in a Welsh accent, which I won't do because this is going to be streamed, um, she's so kind. He said, I was 13 years old, and I'd just sung this song, didn't tell me where, and it was memory or something, and I'd forgotten the words. So I made him up. <laughs> and, and the queen, he's introduced to the queen, and the queen says, you sang beautifully, and uh, I rather preferred your words to the original. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're 13, you've just kind of blown it. And the Queen of the Realm says, you know, be a songwriter. And it's, it's very, and, and you hear all of these stories. And, and so the little things matter to her. And then you hear, you know, a friend of mine went to, I'm, I'm going to do this, sorry, I, I realize you probably want to send everyone home. Feel free to go, I'll just carry talking. It's a <laughs> lovely story of the um, of friends of ours, um, well, it's, yeah, who um, happened to rent a cottage on Balmoral. Um, and uh, so they were staying in one of the, co you can rent cottages there. No idea what they cost, but you can rent cottages there. So they were there for a few weeks. And they suddenly get, uh, somebody comes and knocks on the door and they say, uh, would you mind awfully, or whatever they say in the royal household, if the queen came to visit tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and none of them have brought their tails or their tiaras or anything. You know, they've gone on a family holiday, they've got boots. Lots of them. So they said, well, that would perhaps be fine. And it, the reason is because the cottage they're in is the one that the Queen used to go with her father and Margaret and her mother to holiday in. When they, when, well, what they call in the, in the biographies, we fall or us fall. So anyway, uh, you know, they comb their hair and they clean the whole place as best they can, including the boot cupboard and, and or whatever it's called. And um, so they get ready. And then there's this crunch of tires on, on tarmac and um, you know a Land Rover with two Secret Service people go up there and then there's another crunch of you know tires on tarmac and they look out there's the Queen and she's going to the back of the Land Rover and she's getting out two table lamps so the Queen of the Realm they're very intimidated is marching up in her sort of tweed skirt holding two table lamps and knocks on the door, presumably with one of the table lamps. And she comes in and says, oh, I brought these. I, I hear that the light isn't very good in the bedroom. So <laughs> you know, I just popped these upstairs. And, and, then, and then she sort of chats in for a little while and said, well, you know, talks a little bit. And then she said, then she does a mine of, of backpackers going across Balmoral, you know, to, you know, in the rain and all this stuff. And then she, she wanders around. And she completely makes them feel at ease, like they're very special. And she actually goes into the boot cupboard because it's more than a cupboard. It's a room, sorry, it's the boot room. And uh, it's where they used to play table tennis. So they felt very fortunate they'd done it. So it's, 
the queen is bringing the table lamps. So is that like us? It's not like me, but I'm sure it's like a lot of you. <laughs> you know, it's just a very thoughtful thing to do, isn't it? It's a very thoughtful thing to do, and it's very practical. It's down to earth. So do we get to do that? I think we do. We, we too, can live kindly yeah. and serve. Thank you, Mark. That's been really interesting. You've sold me a bit of the Queen. Yeah. <laughs> 10%. 10%. <laughs> um, it's been really interesting. Thank you very much.